Hi friends, and welcome to the School Librarian Learning Network podcast. I'm Steve Tatro, also known as Dr. T Loves Books, and I love talking about all things related to school libraries. I may be an old dog, but I'm always trying to learn new tricks. In each episode of the SLLN podcast, I'll chat with a school librarian about a lesson they love. Hopefully, this can be a place for school librarians to get ideas and find new ways to engage with their students and staff. As a good friend likes to say, we're better together. So I hope this podcast will help school librarians connect with and learn from each other. The opinions and ideas shared in this podcast by myself and my guests are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. And because school librarians always strive to be good digital citizens, I cite sources when using material that is not my own. Without further ado, let's get to this week's episode. Hey everybody, we're back once again and I am so excited. I've got another Tennessee friend here. Erica Long is gonna be joining us and she is sharing a, I'm really curious to hear about this lesson. It's about art and that's not an area I know a lot about. So I'm gonna learn lots of stuff, not only about the lesson, but about art too. So this is gonna be fun. Erica, thank you so much for joining us. So glad you could be here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Steve. I was glad to be here. Um, thanks for having me on. I'm Erica Long. I'm a secondary librarian. I like to say that because really um, my background was in high school. Mm. But fun fact, I have now been in middle school for longer than I've been in high school at this point. (laughs) 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 Uh, I often wonder why I'm still here in middle school. They're fun. But I also know <laughs> that high school has changed a lot since I previously worked in it. Um, yeah. And I actually did just work in it for like a year, uh, a couple of years ago. But anywho, um, yeah, my pronouns are she, her. I'm currently in uh, the Metro Nashville Public Schools. I'm a middle school librarian at Thurgood Marshall Middle School. Um, I worked th- at this school for three years previously, and this is my first year back. Nice. Ah, they're lucky to have you. How did you end up in school librarianship? Like, was this a plan from the beginning or was, how did Absolutely you? Absolutely not. Yeah. A <laughs> uh, little probably very big known fact about me is that I absolutely did not want to be an educator my entire life. <laughs> um, didn't want it. My mother always said that I should. My dad said that I should be an entrepreneur or self-employed. Um, but, but yeah, I didn't want to be a teacher because I didn't want to be responsible for someone's child not learning. Yes. Yes. A lot um, of pressure. It is a ton of pressure, um, that I don't think the average person understands or knows and yeah. they don't understand it because they don't know it. Um, I, librarianship is a third career. I spent some time in sports and nonprofit before shifting to library school. (laughs) Um, I I spent some time working in sports in a couple of different capacities. One of them was as a, um, as an academic mentor and tutor for college athletes. Nice. Um, And in working with them over the years, that was about seven years, Hmm. um, working with them for that long. um, At the same time, I was also working in nonprofit and I was just ready to shift. Um, I I needed a change um, from the nonprofit scene. Mm. And um, at the time I did not have a master's degree. So while I thought about going full time, as um, an academic advisor or something higher in collegiate sports, Mm -hmm. I needed a master's degree to do that. So I didn't have it and it was like, go back to school. So when I thought about going back to school, I really thought about the things that I felt strongly about in working with those students. Mm -hmm. And those were things like not knowing how to cite sources or always having to help you Hmm. craft an email that's professional to your professors, mm-hmm. lots of different things um, that were related to the work that school librarians do in terms of information literacy and mm-hmm. digital literacy. And just some reflection led me to library school. And so um, I went back to school to get my master's degree in 2014 and have been in this game for 10 years now. <laughs> nice. That's outstanding. 
man, I don't know that if I, if I would have made the connection between um, like citation and writing emails and connect that with the school library. So I think that's a really interesting, yeah. I'm, I'm impressed by that. <laughs> it took a little work to get there. Yeah. <laughs> I was I like, what are the things that I would need to do? Like whose responsibility is it to teach this? Because I couldn't lean on my own library experience for that. I was mm -hmm. a library kid in elementary um, and a little bit in middle school. Mm -hmm. Like I have really vivid memories of my elementary school library. I have some memory of my high school library, but not a ton. I can't remember there being a librarian. I'm sure there was one because we mm -hmm. had a library. Yeah. I remember our class going down there. I remember um, us sitting at the tables with our teacher. I remember using that space after school for club meetings because I was in under society, but a librarian and having library instruction in high school, I couldn't. I, that was something that didn't stand out to me. Um, I used librarians sometimes in college and undergrad, but again, like I had, I had to do the work to figure out what role in the building, um, whose responsibility it was to to try to pick up that mantle for me to figure out what that next career would be. That's, I am very impressed by that because like I said, I would not have connected those dots, but you nailed it like right on the head. That's outstanding. Yeah. So now that you're in the library, you get to do all sorts of fun, cool stuff. And one of the fun, cool things you do is a lesson called the Renaissance Art Tour. So uh -huh. let's tell, tell me about this Renaissance Art Tour. I, I am, like I said, so not an art person generally. So I'm really curious. So this lesson, shockingly, in the 10 years that I've worked in education mm. is the first time that I have collaborated with a social studies or history content. Nice. So Renaissance time period is covered in Tennessee's um, seventh grade social studies courses. Okay. And so I collaborated with the teachers, one, because I shifted away from ELA and personalized, um, I mean, in professional learning networks. Mm -hmm. So instead of my planning time typically being in, in English, um, I shifted over to our social studies content. One, because we have, um, not that they were struggling, but they were just kind of tr trying to get adjusted to this content because they hadn't previously taught social studies hmm. um, in this way. So one, it's just two people on this team. So they're trying to kind of get used to it, keep it fresh, um, get the kids engaged. And it just kind of came about organically. Um, they were talking about some of the resources that the district had provided. And they were pieces of, or images of art. So some of them were like canvases or paintings, but some were sculptures, some was architecture. And so just the different things from that time period. And I love art. Am I the best at analyzing it? No, but I think the beauty of that is it's always open to interpretation. And so that's one of the things that I was able to lean on with one, crafting the lesson, but also encouraging the students that they could each see something different in all of these different works. Um, so they wanted something where um so i was like let me just do it let me do a gallery walk with you and that's what happened um i love that it was the renaissance time period because i could play on beyonce with that <laughs> <laughs> so when people come into your show, show notes and look at my slides um it's like i took Be uh beyonce's renaissance world tour and x'd out the world and made it art um <laughs> So the, the teachers did a little bit of heavy lifting on the front end, right? To introduce what the Renaissance time period was, who some um, key figures are of that time period. And then once they had a little bit of that back, background knowledge, they came to me um, for this art gallery walk. Um, mm. And so they're used to gallery walks in their hallway um where people will where teachers will put a quote or something up or something 
that they're working on in class and then the kids will go around to each one. So for me, what I did was take a few different um, images. So I did two or three paintings and one piece of architecture. Yeah, I did not do okay. the sculpture mm -hmm. as, an, as an option in this one. Um, and now that I think about that, I should have gone back and done it. But I created two sides of the room. So the library was divided into two pieces, into two sides. Okay. Um, and each side had the same images okay. so that they could all get the same thing. Um, and then I had them sitting at tables. We grouped them. I asked their teachers to group them before coming down, which is really important. One, because my school has a very high um, English language learner population, okay. about 43, 45% of our students speak um, Spanish and uh -huh. about another 19 to 20% speak a different language other than English. Wow. And so I need to make sure that they're grouped in a way that they have people that they can lean on in those groups if they don't understand um, what I'm like, if they don't understand my language. So one, I use live presentations in PowerPoint um, I take my Canvas slides and I transfer them to PowerPoint so that I can use live presentation and turn the subtitles on. Nice. So that's helping my 43%, right? But I still yeah. have another 19 or 20. Um, so they're grouped for that reason. But then one other reason is because the, um, the standard that I use from AASL was about learning in groups and using different points of views. So that was the other reason that they were grouped like that. Um, That's and great. I love too that this is because it's a visual medium that you're working with them with. Even the ELL students, they may not have necessarily the language to express it, but it, like you said, it's so open to interpretation, and it's really right. looking at like pattern matching. Why, you know, how are these things similar across this time mm -hmm. period? So you're really, it's. That's a, I hadn't, wow. I really liked that you, yeah. you were thinking about how can I incorporate, <laughs> wow, that's awesome. I love that. And one of the questions that I had for them as they were going through the gallery walk, so I would take an image, put the image up, put the standards that we were working on and put a paragraph about the time period and then another paragraph about the artist and the work in front of them. Okay. And then after they've gone through and read that as a group, so that I assigned them each a number and like number one is going to be responsible for talking about the standards. Number two is going to be responsible for reading the prompt um, or the paragraph about the artist. The next person is reading the prompt. Um, so each prompt was different for each, um, for each, I call them masterpieces. Nice. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so at each masterpiece they had in the gallery, they had a prompt on there. And so they were different level questions. So some were level one, some were level four, some were level five. So it kind of varied um, to mix it up, right? Mm -hmm. And then also knowing that um, observations do exist and we're trying to yes. make sure that we are meeting all of our indicators. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, but also, you know, having a level one question for my level one students who are EL, like right. works out well, right? And my high achievers, I've got a level five question for you mixed in somewhere. So mm -hmm. you're, you're, you've really got this balance. That's um, such a great way to differentiate. I mean, you have differentiated this in such a wonderfully authentic and um, logical way. Like you, you, mm -hmm. the, the planning that you put into making this come together like this is blowing my mind because this is so clever. I want to <laughs> do a sidebar here. <laughs> the planning is one of the times where I was like, why do teachers do this every day? <laughs> <laughs> it's and a lot. I feel for the people who have like four different preps in secondary. I don't know yeah. how they do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> it took me a long time to plan this lesson. I collaborated with our um, English language learner coach who also is the content um, chair for our social studies team. Oh. And so having that like piece in there to help me on the parts where I'm not as knowledgeable, especially the EL piece, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I feel like we do some stuff in our school to make sure that we're meeting the goals, but I know that there are things that we can do greater. Um, and so this was one of the times where I wanted to lean in and really 
tap into the greater that we can do because mm -hmm. I, as a librarian, sometimes or a lot of times know that I'm not doing my best to serve them because translating is is not the, the end all be all. It's not sure. everything that they deserve, right? Right. So right. anyway, bringing it back. Um, so <laughs> I had all of those things at each um, masterpiece and then I gave them about five to six minutes. What I did notice is that, and then we would rotate after they wrote their answer to the prompt, they had post-it notes at each station. So they would write their post-it note answer on there and as a group, um, and then we would rotate. What I did find um, is that they didn't need the whole five to six minutes every rotation. Okay. Um, so they had, I had four different masterpieces, so they would have, they would rotate three times. But because the standards were the same, because the paragraph about the time period was the same, they didn't really need that on the third and fourth masterpiece. So in the end, I can take some of that time back, um, which did allow me to have extra time for them when they did their exit ticket, because their exit ticket was pretty extensive. I did a three, two, one, and the three, two, one was three things you learned, two questions you have, and a one sentence summary. But their summary, they had to include words from the word bank mm. that I provided. And so those were just vocabulary words from their content. Um, but that's a lot in like, you know, most exit tickets will take you a minute if you're right. just trying to get a real like quick pulse yeah. of what what they're uh, what they know or what they gain from it. And so I feel like that one required at least five minutes. And so if you're taking back some of that time in the third and fourth rotation because you don't need to reread every mm -hmm. time um it, it gives you some time on the back end right no that totally makes sense and uh, was this the first time you were doing this lesson or have you done this previous times this was my first time okay okay <laughs> so i mean it sounds like there was a lot i love that the kids are coming in preloaded with some knowledge from social studies as they're walking through the door so you're not starting from scratch with them and they're yeah. you're, that kind of gives you a little bit of flexibility to kind of get to some of the activities yeah, it's always hard to start from scratch um, because you don't really like. I, that's why I like to plan with teachers ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I like to I like to ask them certain questions about what their goal is, what they want, like what they have as the objective for their students with me, because then I can really craft the lesson the way that it's supposed to meet the needs of them and and meet that objective so that the teacher can do what they need to do when they give it to the classroom. Um, but, but it's hard to do that on the front end when they don't have the prior knowledge of the content. Mm. Um, yeah. Because that teacher teaches that content a certain way. Um, they're the one who's the expert in that. I'm not the expert in that content. That's why I'm in the library. I'm an expert in, in seeking information. I can right. do that all day. Right. Um, and using information but yeah it's it's just it's harder to do it the other way around well this lesson certainly has it requires a lot of close collaboration with your teachers which i love like yeah. I, I think a lot of times for a library it can be a little bit catch as catch can like oh can you take my kids for an hour okay here's an information literacy lesson i can whip out that you know i can mm -hmm. do whether or not you've done other stuff but this is clearly very integrated with what they're doing in the classes which is awesome right. like that they're seeing there's the library is not just a separate space. It's a bridge between mm -hmm. your classes and what you're doing. Having done this for the first time and having sort of seen how things went, are you sort of reflecting, formulating? Are there any th things you see changing as you move forward? Are, are you planning to do it again? I guess is the first question. <laughs> uh, not this year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're done. I did both of the teachers. So I've done every student in seventh grade. Wow. So every student okay. in seventh grade has had this lesson. Um, I So I would do it again in a different year, right? When they are hitting that standard again or those standards again. Um, one of the things that I did in my lesson was ask for feedback. Mm -hmm. So I did a fist to five. Um, how did you enjoy the gallery walk? Okay. Fist to five. And they didn't know ahead of time. 
because then they would have all just said five. So <laughs> after they gave me their responses, I then went back and said, what would have made it better? What would have made it a five? And so they had to give me the reason that would have, what I could have done to make it a five. Some people said, have food. Some people said, <laughs> get through all of them. Cause like my first and second one, we didn't get through all of them because I didn't hit that learning curve yet. Okay. So I kept giving them those six minutes the whole mm -hmm. time. Um, not realizing that they weren't really, they were getting through it faster. And I'm over here like, listening in to other people and not paying attention to the fact that we've hit this lull, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, modifying the timing um, in that way. Um, I think um, I would go back and, like I said, in hindsight, I should have added a sculpted piece to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think I would do the architecture differently, either keep it in and add more um, content or discussion around what the commonalities were in architecture mm -hmm. during that time. Because we talked a lot about painting, like having the very muted tones, um, the blank faces, mm -hmm. you know, no smiles and things like that. Um, how there's a lot of religious aspects to it and all of those mm -hmm. things. So I think that it very much so focused on the art piece, mm -hmm. um, on the painting in terms of art. But um, if I kept a, an a piece of architecture in there in the future, then I would definitely make sure to go in and add some highlights to that on the front end um, before starting the gallery walk. Um, I love that you included architecture at all because when you were saying yeah. art, like I, it literally would not have occurred to me. Like, yes, the architecture is also artistic. Like, that's yeah. part of the, the movement. And so I, one, I think, it's I think great. one of the things that I learned in preparing for this lesson was some of the people that we think of as painters were also architects. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it is not something that we just absolutely think of on the front end. And so it was a learning opportunity for me. Um, and that's why I wanted to make sure that I included it in there. I love it. And I mean, I guess that's part of the origin of that phrase, like a, you're a Renaissance person that you have all these different yeah. skills that you can incorporate. And it makes sense. And yet not something I would have thought of. I'm so glad that yeah. you were able to bring that to the <laughs> students and help them see like, yeah, there's more to this than just paint on a canvas. I love that. Huh? Yeah. I've got one other question about just the general, uh, I guess, logistics of it. So you were working with the social studies teachers and they had done a bunch of background to get the kids sort of ready. How did that end up translating into the kids come to the library as opposed to them doing this maybe in their classrooms? Like, was there a reason for that crossover or was it just to kind of cement the connection between the two spaces for the students or? So I will say this. In our, um, in those specific classrooms, they don't get a lot of like movement time. Gotcha. Um, and I'm very big on the person doing the most work is the person doing the learning, right? The person talking the most is the person learning the most. And so that's why I don't do a ton of talking in mm. my teaching. I leave the heavy lifting to them. They're the ones who are supposed to be tired at the end of the day, not me. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, they had, again, they had these resources that the district has put into this folder. And it's like, okay, but I really lean on my textbook. What am I supposed to do with this? Right? right. And so I could see it. Like, as soon as I see the resources, I could see it in my head and see it taking shape. And I could have easily done it in their classroom. But why? Because sometimes you get more out of a kid when you change up their space. Absolutely. Um, I could easily go teach any library lesson in somebody's classroom because the resources that I'm using are digital. Mm -hmm. You got your laptop. I don't have to bring you down here so you can use the computer. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes just a change of environment switches it up for them and it kind of changes the way that they feel about learning. Um, and you just 
sometimes you just want to. I don't stay in the in the library all day. I go in people's classrooms. I yeah. go in people's offices. Like I gotta get out of that just to keep it fresh. And so um, I'm always happy to do that. But that doesn't mean that I don't go teach in classrooms because sometimes I do. Oh yeah, no, no, I'm sure. I was just curious if there was, you know, logistically like, oh, well, they didn't have the space, but it makes a ton of sense. Even just to for the even if the only reason was just to give the kids mm. the chance to move around and get a different perspective, I think that's incredibly yeah. important because like you said, it's easy to get bored learning in the same space and kind of you, you get into a particular <laughs> mindset in, in your classroom. You and do. then when you go to the library, different mindset, different setting. So that's, right. I, I think that's great. Um, if someone was going to try and do this for the first time, like they're starting from scratch, they've got your idea, they've got your um, slides. Do you have any suggestions, advice for things they should have in mind as they get ready to do this for the first time? Um, I think knowing your audience is a big piece of that. Um, and I mm. guess I shouldn't say audience, but knowing your students. Um, like I know that I needed the supports from my EO coach because yeah of my history and how I felt like I wasn't serving them well. Um, I, so knowing your, your students, um, knowing or having some knowledge, like bare bone knowledge of the content um, is important as well because you're giving, you're questioning the kids, right? But they're probably gonna have a question to you as well. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to answer that. Now, can the teacher step in? Absolutely. Um, but what if they happen to walk out and go to the bathroom? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I think it's great. Like so often when we do library lessons, I think the teachers learn as much as the students when we're doing stuff about yeah. digital literacy or resources or whatever. So I think it's great when we get the opportunity to sort of flip that script a little bit and maybe learn some stuff from the teachers and, you know, be the student to the teacher so that we can maybe bring that extra content. That's great. That's I think that true. opens up such a great two-way street between, you know, both sides of that mm, divide, as it were. Yeah. The Pretty last good. thing that I would say about this one is to just, like, it is definitely not one that you can just, it's not a pocket lesson at all. Um, there's a lot of prep that goes into it. And while I've done, like, the biggest part of the prep, there's still, like, pulling the images that you want to choose. I had the citations on there because they need to know citations. Like we're yes. still going to be library up in here, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the citations were on there, like printing out all of the resources and me, like I eliminated some of them because I knew like I wasn't teaching all of these kids in the same day. Um, uh, so yeah. having that laminated helped it to last longer because I needed it for over a week. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just, just things like that, like it's, it's definitely not a pocket lesson. So having the time um, ahead of time to prepare all of the stuff that you need, because um, even, even printing all of the masterpieces out and having the, um, the prompt with it and the paragraphs to go with it with the standards, I did all of that and pasted it on chart paper. And then pasted the chart papers, the chart paper around the rooms. So nice. Yeah, you gotta you gotta have that time to to make sure that you can get everything done and set up. Yeah, and when you said laminating the the pieces, I hadn't thought about that. But man, that'd be a great tool to have that you could then have the kids like with whiteboard markers they could write on the laminated stuff and like okay, that's circle true. the thing that uh, yeah. stands out in this or whatever it might be. Huh? Yeah. I like that. I, I would not have thought of to laminate. That's so, yeah. I love it. Hmm. Man. All right. I love this <laughs> lesson. This is, there's so many cool things going on in Thanks. this that are just not things that would have occurred to me. And I love, that's one of the things I love about doing this podcast is I get to learn awesome stuff. Yeah. So thank you for sharing this lesson. You're welcome. Now we are going to go in a completely different direction. We're going to take our book break. Book Right. You get to share any book you want to share. It can be uh, something personal, professional for the students, for the staff, for whoever, whatever, <laughs> whatever you like. Share a book that you've enjoyed that we can enjoy too. Um, just I, I don't. I was about to ask the question: Is if I'm like out in front of people? <laughs> <see me. laughs> hey, do you use Libro FM? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have not used Libro uh, FM. I know oh it exists. Goodness, you have to use Libro. There are yeah. a few. 
few days left in um, February and Asia Wilson's memoir, Dear Black Girls, How to Be True to You, is one of the educator listening copies for February. Okay. And um, if you download it, you can listen to it whenever, but you know, it's it won't be up there after February as an okay. early listening copy. After February, you would have to pay for it. Let me just say it that way. <laughs> um, so um, I absolutely love Asia Wilson. Um, I'm a huge fan of Dawn Staley and the University of South Carolina Gamecocks, Gamecocks women's basketball team. Um, I love the Aces. There are some people on that team that I absolutely adore. Candace Parker, Tennessee. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I was very stoked to see her release a memoir. Um, and there I'm gonna, is, I'm going to plead go ignorance here. I don't know who Asia Wilson is. So if you can enlighten me, I would appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. So Asia Wilson is a women's basketball player. She plays in the WNBA for the Las Vegas Aces. Okay. She is a now two-time WNBA champion. Uh, nice. She's also a two-time um, MVP of the um, championship tournament. Hmm. Um, she's a native of South Carolina. She went to USC and played under Don Staley. Um, the USC South Carolina, not the USC California, for those <laughs> listening. <laughs> um, um, she, she is so cool um, in sharing this story. And the reason it seems behind her sharing her story is, one, she's in awe of the fact that she is where she is to be a person who did not know for the longest time that she struggled because she has dyslexia. Hmm. She was in her teens or later in life when hmm. she was diagnosed. And so a lot of the time growing up, she wasn't sure. She just didn't feel confident because she knew that there were things that she was missing, but she couldn't put a name to it and nobody else did either. Hmm. Um, she writes this as a kind of love letter, I think, to girls and helping to helping them to one, like understand that those little times where you're not feeling like yourself or you don't feel like you belong or you don't know where you belong, it's okay. Like we've all been at that stage. Um, and, and kind of just walking through some of her experiences and the people who helped her um, kind of navigate those. And some of those mm. people were like her grandmother, uh, Coach Staley, her parents. Her dad was one. Um, that, and that was one that where she felt like she was disappointing him because mm. he was this basketball player back in the day. He used to play overseas. She was not a basketball player. She just kind of so happened into it. Um, huh. and, and wasn't good at it. And he told her, it's okay if you like, don't want to do this because you don't have it in you. Like you don't show that you want this. And so she ended up coming back to him and letting him know that she did. And that's when she kind of like pushed up her work, ethic, work ethic. And so I think it's just really a sentimental, um, a sentimental sharing or offering for the masses. Um, and it's, like I said, it's really cool to have this woman who is, has grown into her own, um, has learned how to navigate life as a person with dyslexia, um, and now can say that she's an author. Because as she says, who would have thought a little girl with dyslexia would be an author of a New York Times bestselling book? So. That's so amazing. I love that. Wow. Oh, I definitely, well, now I have to go to Libro <laughs> FM and, and check this out because this sounds amazing. Wow, I love it. Yeah. Make sure oh, you tell, make you. sure you get on there as an educator. They, okay. They have tons of, um, they have tons of early listening copies available um, each month and they switch out. Okay. Month. So you just I'm not usually much of a, it's free. Uh, 
Okay. And I'm not usually person. much of an audiobook person generally, but if if it's the right audiobook, yeah. I mean, it just sucks. I, in, I so. was just going to say that um, I'm very much so a print person, but my commute is a lot longer now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so sometimes I can just get through audiobooks faster because I'm driving an hour each way. Um, oh, yeah. And, and I can knock those things out while I'm driving. I know our friend Amy Herman has become a huge lover of audiobooks because she uh, <laughs> listens to them on her commute. She listens to them when she's around the house doing yeah. stuff. She she loves them. She's always recommending them. And I need to I need to work on that for myself because yeah. I know that's a great way to take in material in a different way. There are some things that I won't recommend on audio. I think it definitely has to have the absolute right um, narrator. I've mm. I've listened to part of a book before, and the narrator won awards for this book, and I was like, I, it's not my, it's, I can't do it. And it's Sometimes not it that particular book. It's just mm -hmm. I don't do well with that narrator's voice because they've narrated some other stuff, and I've not mm -hmm. listened to it either because it just I try it, it just doesn't work. Are yeah. they phenomenal at their job? Absolutely, because they're also an actress. And I was like, oh, watch you any day on TV, but this just isn't working <laughs> for me. It's not my jam. And that's okay. We all have different things. We have different tastes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. But some other people absolutely loved them on there. So it's all about, you know, it's all about preference. Oh, absolutely. And like you said, nothing wrong with that. We can, we all have yeah. our preferences. And as long as we're enjoying what we're enjoying, <laughs> that's what matters. That's where it comes yeah. down to. So love it. All right. I'm definitely going to dig into that. Well, thank you again so much. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to share this awesome lesson and this awesome book recommendation. I'm very excited to dig into this myself a little bit, play around a little bit. This, is, this seems like a lot of fun, so I'm looking forward to it. Oh, thank you. Thanks for checking out this episode of the SLLN Podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes, which include not only a link to the lesson, but also links to the SLLN website home to a curated list of free upcoming virtual events and resources for school librarians. It's easy to become a member of the network. Just visit the site and use what you like. If you have an idea, a question, or a lesson you want to share, you can email schoolliblearning at gmail.com. That's school, L-I-B, learning at gmail.com. Know someone with a great school library lesson? Let us know. Until next time, be safe, be good, and be well.